Paul Duncombe, A Biography of a Visual Cultural Proponent by Larry Isaacs. The roots of visual culture can be traced to British cultural studies. During the 1980s, this area of inquiry came to academic studies in the United States. In the 1990s, visual culture found its way into art education literature, and by the end of the decade, visual culture studies emerged in the field of art education. One of the leading experts in defining, supporting, and implementing visual culture into art education is Dr. Paul Duncombe. Tracing his history from comic book nerd and academic school dropout to a forefather of educational framework shows how childhood experiences, intellectual influences, and social distinctions shaped his academic and professional journey. Paul Duncan was born on March 25, 1950 and grew up in the outer suburb of Sydney, Australia. His mother was a housewife while his father worked as a cabinet maker. They lived a lower middle class lifestyle and were Methodists. Duncan's parents valued education in the traditional sense as a means to getting a good job with high pay. His cultural interactions and interests during his childhood were going to church socials, the radio, and trips to the beach. In addition, he read comic books, went to the movies, and enjoyed watching a black and white TV at a friend's house down the road from his home. When Duncan was 12, his family finally purchased their own TV set, which was a profound event. His cultural awareness of the arts significantly expanded. Duncan's parents would have never attended live theater or visited an art gallery, so the TV provided all new forms of art into his life. At this stage in his life, he considered himself a nerd. Duncan had written a couple of novels as well as drawn comic strips of aliens and cowboys. Furthermore, he wrote or drew for hours every day. Duncan's writing was inspired by Tom Sawyer and the film Journey to the Center of the Earth. His drawings were inspired by comic books and westerns like Hopalong Cassidy. Duncan's parents thought his drawings and writings were childish pastimes, and his mother would humiliate him and his father dismiss his writings for his frivolous pursuits. When he was 16, Duncan decided to leave school. Because he was dyslectic and struggled with traditional academics, he went to art school because he felt he could draw. While at art school, he decided to pursue graphic design, partly because his father thought studio artists had no chance of making any money. He graduated in 1972 with his diploma of graphic design and began work at an advertising agency. While working at the ad agency, Duncan designed advertisements for commercial products and created storyboards for television advertisements. After 18 months on the job, Duncan quit. Working in a morally empty industry for sake of profits did not sit well with him. He commented, quote, it took little time to realize that advertising was the pointy end of capitalism, that it was little more than selling products for global corporations to make hefty profits, end quote. Duncan wanted to do something with moral worth that was more in line with the Methodist sermons he had heard about social justice. In addition, Duncan was a teen during the Vietnam War and was resisting the draft. His social and moral compass was starting to guide his life. In 1973, Duncan realized he could get the Australian federal government to pay for tuition for college and provide extra money to live on. So he went to college and in 1977 received his degree in visual arts. During his college years, he began to formulate his ideas about visual culture. Two of his professors, art theorist Donald Brook and visual communication professor David Sless, had a great influence on him. Sless's focus was on visual communication, what we now call visual culture. Duncan remarked, quote, Sless was a sociologist who viewed imagery fine and popular not as part of social hierarchy, but as socially leveled. Thus, as far back as the 1970s, I was introduced to the ideas that were essentially, if not postmodern, at least pre-postmodern. What was critical for me was that a sociological approach to the visual arts as a form of human communication accepted the validity of popular culture, end quote. This translated into a new focus on pictures rather than art. Duncan's focus was bolstered by the social distinctions of his peer, student peers. Many of his peers came from privileged backgrounds and studying visual arts was aligned with their social class. Art was part of upper class society, while popular visual culture was lowbrow and part of a lower social class. His peers believed the world was, quote, theirs for the taking, unquote, and that fine art was the only art that mattered in the world. 
Duncan's social distinctions and intellectual influences regarding visual culture led him to an interest in the unsolicited drawing of children. Furthermore, he saw a connection with children who draw on their own time and of their own accord for hours every day was like what he did in his childhood. In addition, Duncan liked the children, would receive little praise for their work, and for the most part, the art was dismissed. At first, Duncan's pursuit of unsolicited drawing was solely academic. He was researching an early art education controversy over whether children should be allowed to copy from other drawings. However, Duncan came to, quote, realize that my study was an attempt to validate these children and thereby heal what in popular psychology is called my own wounded inner child, un in unquote. In 1979, Duncan graduated with an MA in art education. He then began graduate studies to continue his research on unsolicited children's drawings. During this time, Brenton and Marjorie Wilson were conducting important research in the field. Duncan writes, quote, they were championing it as a creative development tool, a way for children to explore both real and imaginary worlds. Moreover, they were claiming that unsolicited drawing was almost invariably far more sophisticated than what passed for art education in elementary schools, unquote. Children were drawing from popular culture sources to not only learn to draw, but also explore age-old themes. This included the hero's quest, rags of riches stories, conflicts of good and evil, loyalty, and overcoming hardship. Duncombe undertook case studies of several contemporary children, examining what they drew, how they learned to draw, and the environmental circumstances that appeared to facilitate their drawing, the environmental inducements for drawing. Through these case studies, Duncan determined that the unsolicited drawings remained troubling for Wilson and himself. The Wilsons wanted to move children away from popular sources to fine art sources because they assumed it is as being inherently superior. Duncan argued that popular culture was not inferior, but inherently worthy. However, this assertion proved to be problematic because there was no way to argue this during the 1980s. Duncan addresses this problem, quote, the art education literature was deeply modernist. Either popular culture was condemned with all fervor or zealotry, or, and this was the most common approach, ignored altogether. To champion unsolicited drawing with all its popular culture references, I needed to look elsewhere, to look outside art education discord, unquote. To solve this issue and champion visual culture in art education, Duncan would look at several educational frameworks to support his assertion. The cultural pluralist approach held that all forms of cultural expression were not only valid, but also equally valid. This approach was championed by the field of American popular culture studies. Popular culture was synonymous with American culture and celebrated it no matter how many ambiguities or contradictions that may arise. This proves problematic for Duncan as the approach failed to address problems in cultural expression. Duncan addresses this problem when he writes, quote, Cultural pluralism certainly offered a way to celebrate popular culture alongside other kinds of visual art, and for me, children's unsolicited drawing. However, cultural pluralism had no way to deal with social ambiguity, let alone outright social contradictions. Cultural pluralism ignored all the problems with popular culture. Cultural pluralism thus appeared hopelessly inadequate to address popular culture, even to be morally suspect." Unquote. Duncan continued his analysis of educational frameworks until he came to British cultural studies. British cultural studies draws on the European view of societies as conflictual, where social groups not only compete with one another for influence and power, but are frequently ruthless in their pursuit. Duncan had found the educational model that would support and champion his visual culture belief. Duncan writes, quote, I found an uneasy balance struck between recognizing the value of popular culture and providing reference points for people's lives and a critique of its oftentimes offensive ideologies. It allowed me to both champion popular culture and its influence of children's unsolicited drawing and to critique it. It provided a framework to champion unsolicited drawing as a creative act, but also simultaneously problemize, problemize it to understand it has caught up in the same social contradictions as its popular models." Unquote. In 1987, Duncan received his PhD and began to advocate for the study of popular culture as a legitimate part of art education. In 1991, he wrote a paper that systematically refuted the arguments long offered against popular culture, 
and for this he was awarded the prestigious Manuel Barkin Memorial Award from the National Art Education Association in the United States. In 1992, Duncan visited the United States and traveled across the country staying with the art educators. This proved to be a turning point in his career. <clears throat> On the recommendation of Canadian art educator Graham Chalmers, Duncan would visit Las Vegas. From there, he would travel to Los Angeles and visit Universal Studios and Disneyland. Duncan commented how these places made him feel disoriented, astonished, thrilled, overwhelmed, but also lost. When Duncan returned home to Australia, he realized that he just did not have an intellectual framework to address these overwhelming participatory experiences totally given over to pleasure. Duncan writes, quote, British culture studies had been helpful in dealing with and critically with small and discrete cultural forms like drawings and photographs, even television programs, but it appeared quite inadequate to address these entirely immersive, completely hedonistic, and highly artificial constructed environments, unquote. To expand and adequately address all forms of visual culture, Duncan delved into postmodern theory. He discovered that visual culture, according to postmodernists, was a very sobering and distressing experience. Duncan continues, quote, For them, a society increasingly reliant upon imagery represented a decline in authority of language and thus of reason. Imagery represented seduction by sensation and emotion, not deliberative thought, not logic. Originating with Plato, this is a view reiterated throughout Western philosophy. Language represents logic and the mind open which civilized life rests. Images represent the body and unreason." Unquote. Duncan increasingly drew upon postmodern aesthetics in which all kinds of visual phenomenon and their effects are included. With a postmodern aesthetics, he argued for an aesthetics of the embodiment and for holding intention, ideology, and aesthetics as sensory, as sensory and emotional lure. These two concerns, an embodiment of aesthetics and the necessary tension between ideology and aesthetics, were inspired by a personal experience that perfectly illustrated postmodern theory, as well as distilling my earlier experience of Las Vegas and Los Angeles theme parks. In 1995, Duncan visited a karaoke bar in Pennsylvania. He was listening to some music, which he thoroughly enjoyed to the point he felt he could feel it come from within his own body. Duncan was totally lost in the moment with the feelings of pleasure and joy washing over him. Unfortunately, he was stopped in this moment when he saw the lyrics projected on the screen, which were sexist, even misogynistic. Duncan reflects, quote, what I experienced was a cognitive dissonance between being completely taken over by the music, but also appalled at the ideas and values expressed by the lyrics. From this experience, I could see more clearly how aesthetics wrapped ideologies in such pleasure that it made rejecting objectionable ideas that more and more difficult because to reject the ideas would mean complicating the pleasure on offer." Unquote. As a result of analyzing postmodern theory, Duncan completed his visual culture framework for art education. He advocated for an art education curriculum framed in terms of cultural literacy, in terms of an aesthetics of the everyday, using the concept of new times and then address global culture. In addition, he also addressed cultural sites not commonly considered in art education, such as soap operas, family photography, and images of children as variously represented in mass media as well as the fine arts, as innocents, as knowing adults, as victims of abuse, as perpetrators of evil, as learners, as consumers, as aesthetic, and most disturbingly, as erotic. By the end of the 1990s, visual culture studies emerged. Duncan began to define the term specifically for art education as, quote, all visible artifacts, studies in terms of the beliefs and values from which they arise and with which they are viewed, unquote. In addition, he wrote papers about appropriate pedagogy, the rhythmatic structure of visual culture, curriculum, and ways in which it is being interpreted by art educators, both theoretically and in K-12 classrooms. Duncan introduced two terms into visual culture and art education, multiliteracy to acknowledge the multimodal nature of popular culture and sensorium to the multi-sensory nature of popular culture. In recent years, Duncan has continued to look at topics appropriate to an art education informed by visual culture. He has considered a variety of popular visual pleasures, including the highly emotional, the vulgar, the horrific, the exotic, the erotic, the formulaic, and the humorous. Specifically, he looked at politically incorrect British seaside postcards 
in the gruesome tropes of horror movies. Duncan approached each of these pleasures in terms of linking historical examples to contemporary examples with the intention of arguing that no matter how today's visual culture may appear, a decline from previous times, it was anything but. Throughout his life, Duncan has been interested not in art, but pictures. Duncan comments, quote, it is pictures of all kinds that help form and inform people's minds. Pictures and popular at that, not new world art that is a dominant cultural form of our time, unquote. In addition, Duncan realizes that this fascination with pictures occurred at a young age and propelled his professional and academic pursuits for his entire life. He writes, quote, there seems little doubt in my mind that one's own deepest self and one's intellectual, professional pursuits are intertwined. In a sense, one's professional life is a way to understand oneself, sometimes to heal or to justify oneself, and in some cases to understand why one is not like the other people. References <laughs>